entertainment, insights. Don't take life too seriously. Welcome to Brainsky Unleashed. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Brainsky Unleashed. This today is probably one of my most favorite podcast recordings ever. I am honored and thrilled to be with a man who is, I would say, probably the daddy of the Mac daddy when it comes to private equity. He is like the, the, the hot stepper. He is the lyrical gangster when it comes to private equity. Today on our show, we have all-time best-selling author, three books, private equity handbook, exit strategy, empire builder. We've got Adam Coffey. Adam, welcome to the show. Thomas, good to be here. Good to see you. Glad we finally were able to make this happen, get our schedule synced up. Hello to all your listeners out there. It's, uh, it's good to be here. Oh, man, I'm happy to have you. So we're going to talk about private equity today because I have been a fan of yours since uh, meeting you at an event called uh, Mega Success uh, last November. And I have read your books and I have been to your seminars and I am like now a, a faithful disciple of the Adam Coffee style private equity. And I'm going to be doing a roll you. up. I'm rolling up with Adam Coffee. So let, let's talk about that for a minute. First of all, for, for those of you uh, who are unaware, uh, Adam, you have, uh, you have bought and sold 58 companies. You have had how many exits up to over $2 billion? Two and a half billion in, uh, in exits, but who's counting? No right? one is counting. Two and a half. Yeah, that's, and that says billion. CEO, you know, total exits. I'm over 3 billion now, um, but as CEO, two and a half billion. Only over 3 billion. So we're not exactly talking to somebody here who does theory. We're talking to someone who does fact. I love that. I am. I, I'm definitely a practitioner, you know, and I, I, I have a lot of friends, you know, I teach in the academic environment too, and I have a lot of friends who are professors and, and I, I chide them from time to time, you know, and, and I, I talk about, hey, in life, you can learn from people who teach theory, or you can learn from people who have walked in the shoes, you know, that you hope to walk in one day, they've walked down the road, you know, to success that you're hoping to, uh, to follow. And, and so I, I'm, I'm always, you know, kind of gently ribbing my, my academic friends, you know, they're brilliant too, in their own rights, but Yes, I am a practitioner. Amen. Live the dream, Amen. which means I've made every mistake a human being can make over a 21-year run as a CEO. You know, throw in 10 years with Jack Welsh at GE, so you're talking 31 years in business. And you know, I've, I've made all those mistakes, and so you don't have to, listeners. I am so glad that I have so much in common with you, Adam, because I too have made lots of mistakes, lots of <laughs> wonderful mistakes, which are so educational. So uh, let me ask you this, because private equity tends to scare the living crap out of people. Can you explain to me why is private equity not actually the boogeyman? You know, great question. So I, I, I find kind of a couple common themes here. One of them is when we hear about private equity, we hear about it. Maybe it's on the news, you know, a news story, CNBC. We hear something, you know, where, wherever we hear Generally, if we hear about something on TV, it's negative. Almost never do we get the positive side of, of any industry because you know, because positive news doesn't sell. Doesn't get so ratings. We, yeah. Yeah. We, we, we hear the dirt. We hear all the crap, you know, and then you hear about, you know, horror stories from people at mixers or ACG events or wherever you happen to be. And, and, and it's like someone had a bad experience and 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 they're talking about that bad. It's bad experience. And. So I, I'd say there's the fear of, of what we don't understand, what we don't know. And you know, having been to, to my seminars, you know, when I talk about private equity, I generally like to give a 10 question quiz to uh, multiple choice, real easy questions. Um, and I give it to a room full of people. And these are not people who are, are unsuccessful. These are business owners. These are, are millionaires and, uh, and, and hell, in some cases, billionaires. And, and yeah, I, I've been in that room and in yeah. nine, nine figure millionaires, eight figure millionaires billionaires it, and it, 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 and when i give the, my basic 10 question quiz thomas 90 percent of the room fails miserably and people who pass generally get a six six out of ten and so i know that while most entrepreneurs have heard of private equity in fact they have a very uh rudimentary or just wrong understanding of what it is and how it works and so i think 
as a result of that, we're afraid of what we don't understand. You have to keep something in mind if you're an entrepreneur. The reason why we have an ability to build a company and sell it and make a fortune is because there is this thing out there called private equity that props up and creates a market by which you know, we are able to, to sell our businesses for, for high multiples, big numbers. And you know, today, you know, private equity, six trillion in assets under management, over 8,000 firms, and by about 50% of all companies bought and sold on the planet. So they're everywhere. You can't hide from them. So instead of sticking your proverbial head in the sand and ignoring it, we need to get educated because if we get educated about it as entrepreneurs and business owners, we can learn how it works, learn what it needs to be successful. And I hate to use the word manipulate, but we can feed it what it needs and take from it what we want, which is capital to invest in our businesses and to generate wealth, you know, for our, our families, build our empires. And so, you know, it, it, we need to we need to understand and have a very good understanding, deep understanding of, of what private equity is and how it works so that we can maximize its potential in our businesses uh, when we're an entrepreneur. Now, we talk about that. And yet most of us uh, little people who haven't really <clears throat> swam in the swim lanes of private equity, and we'll get to that because that is a thing. And it's actually one of the most important parts of your books, actually, as far as I'm concerned, is, is to explaining things and just the importance of that. But <clears throat> we all think in terms of, you know, we've got to build our business. We're going to stay in our business for 30 years. We're going to, or, or we're, going to, we're just going to start a business and grow a business. We're going to buy a business. We're going to fix a business and we're going to grow a business. But we don't necessarily think in terms of the way you frame the, the uses and purposes of private equity to actually generate wealth. So in other words, most of us go out, I've done it, I'm that guy, and bought themselves or started themselves a really lovely job. But you, on the other hand, <laughs> completely flip the script. And you could say you too can be an entrepreneur, but instead of having a job, you treat this thing like a very, very important investment that needs to be worked diligently and that you could pull out of that investment, not in 20 years, but in like three and walk away with far more than you could after 20 years with that dream that you had. So can you kind of go into that a little bit and explain what our- Yeah, and, and, and let me use a prop. So let me go here to my camera. Let me just pan up. So on the bottom one, you see me flying a World War II P-51 Mustang. And on the top, you know, doing a, an upside down aileron roll over Orange County, California. And then on the top one, I'm flying my my two seat burger chaser, you know, off the coast of Catalina Island, you know, chasing a buffalo burger. Why do I show you those? Well, for your entrepreneurs and listeners out there, um, what do pilots do? We take off. But before we take off, we have a destination in mind. We know where we're going and then we deconstruct the trip. You know, how much fuel do I need? You know, and what are the, the air, you know, what's the weather like in route? What are the winds aloft? And if I get into trouble, what are my backup airports? You know, I, I make all my contingencies. So as a pilot, I start with a destination and then I deconstruct the trip, you know, and I mentally prepare, I prepare the aircraft, you know, and, and I, I take off when I'm ready to do that. And I, I, I fly that journey. You know, when you're an entrepreneur, too many business people just start a company you know, or buy a company. And it's like, they really don't have an idea or a sense of where they're going. And so they don't know when they've arrived and they're unable to deconstruct the journey. And as a result of that, you know, we, we, we spend a lot of time and no matter how rich we are, the one thing in life we cannot buy is time. And so we're wasting time. So what, well, you know, let me use a real life example. Last empire that I built, um, I started with a platform company, had a private equity sponsor, um, and we bought eight companies. We bought eight companies in three years, and then we sold it. And you know, we got a four times multiple of invested capital. And then in the next two years, I bought fifteen more companies. And and so you know, you don't need a long you know or a lot of time to make something happen. You know, I'm out. And so the biggest mistake I think entrepreneurs make is they think of an exit as a one and done event. So I'm going to build my business. I'm going to work in it for 20 years. And then at some point I'm going to get old and I'm going to sell this puppy. And then I'm going to ride off into the sunset. And, and I tell people, it's like, boy, you're missing an opportunity. You know, what you think is the exit, you know, the, the one exit, you know, it's a one and done event. 
I see it as the first rest stop in the wealth creation highway. And highways have many rest stops. You got off at the first rest stop. You know, I'm, I'm glad for you. You're, I'm happy. You're happy. You got a, a wheelbarrow full of gold. But my personal record is selling the same company five times in 13 years. And so I got five wheelbarrows full of gold. You thought there was only one out there. And, and a lot of entrepreneurs that I, I call it the accidental arrogance of success. So sometimes they, they also think, you know, hey, if I sell my business, I'm leaving. I'm not going to be a rollover investor or minority shareholder. I'm God's gift to this thing. And it's like, no way am I going to partner behind somebody else who technically can fire me or tell me what to do. I've never had a boss, never going to have a boss, you know, kind of thing. And, and I think, boy, you know, that, that it, how arrogant is that? Let's look at the, the world's richest two men. Um, you know, so I'm thinking Jeff Bezos, I'm thinking Elon Musk. And, you know, last statistics I saw, I think Jeff Bezos owns today around 10.9% of, of Amazon, which means he's a minority shareholder, which means that somebody else owns, you know, owns, you know, almost 90% of that company. And I think Elon Musk owns like 13% of Tesla, Tesla, something like that. And so at the end of the day, it's like, boy, you know, private equity is a tool. I'm a tool for them. They've got limited partners who invest a lot of money. They need returns. And so the private equity firm comes with a checkbook. They're looking for an investment to back. They're not looking to tell me how to run my company. They're looking to, to, to help me accelerate my growth and to create returns that they can pass on to their, to their investors. And I look at them and say, boy, wouldn't it be great if I never had to worry about capital? And I wanted to buy 23 companies over a five-year period like I did with my last one, you know, and spend hundreds of millions of dollars. And I don't have to sign any personal guarantees. And I don't have to worry about where that money's going to come from. All I got to do is find the 23 companies to buy. And I've got an unlimited checkbook, you know, and, and boy, wouldn't that be fun if I had an unlimited checkbook and, and I could grow my business at the fastest pace possible. And so, you know, I, I think that when we truly understand private equity and, and how it works, and we think of it like a tool, you know, a, a, it's a tool with a lot of money, it can solve a lot of problems for us, but it can help us accelerate the growth trajectory of our empires. And I, I usually sit down with an entrepreneur, you know, when I'm thinking about buying his company and, and trying to convince them to join my buy and build and be a rollover investor and get multiple bites of the apple. And I usually build a spreadsheet and I'll build two rows across. And on one, it'll be, okay, Mr. Entrepreneur, Mrs. Entrepreneur, what's your revenue today? What's your, your EBITDA, your earnings? And uh, what's your growth rate? And so let's roll tape forward five years. How big are you? What kind of multiple do you think you'd sell for? How much do you think we're worth as an enterprise? Then let's roll tape forward five more years. How big are we? You know, let's see what we think we would sell for then. And I do that exercise. And then I go up top. What if you sell me your business today? And for every dollar I give you, you take 70 cents home. You're going to have to pay some taxes. And then you invest it elsewhere. We'll track the returns you get on this investment. But you've also got diversification of your, your assets now. You know, you're not all invested in a company. You've got some in the company, 30% rolled forward. And you've taken 70 cents off the table. And you've invested it elsewhere. Now, with an unlimited checkbook, what kind of a growth trajectory could we achieve? Well, let me show you what I'm actually doing. And because you get to be a rollover investor in this thing, I buy another seven, eight companies, 15 companies, whatever that number is over the next five years. This is how big we are now. This is the multiple for which we trade. And here's the return on your rollover investment. Oh, isn't it interesting how the second check is bigger than the first? And so now we roll over again, 30 cents on a dollar. We get another liquidity event and we grow again using somebody else's capital and growing as fast as possible. Roll out forward another five years and get another bite of the apple. Third one's bigger than the second. Second one's bigger than the first. Each time you diversified, you invested elsewhere. We got those returns as well. Every time I build that spreadsheet using their own assumptions, I have never yet done this exercise and had an entrepreneur make more by staying 100% shareholder and staying independent. The, the growth and the, the, the increase in the growth rates that happens when we partner with unlimited capital, you know, with a private equity firm, 
really juices up our own personal returns. And so there is another way to do this. We, we just have to understand how it works, know how the game's played, and then, and then play the game. That's it. Boy, that was a long diatribe. I didn't so, mean to do that. Yeah, on okay. You. So let's, let's kind of boil it down a little bit, right? So let's say that, you know, myself or my listeners or whoever, they go, man, Adam, I've never heard anything like this. First of all, buy the book, read the book, buy the book, read the book, buy the book, read the book, and go see Adam live in February. I have one more opportunity to do that. Just putting that plug in there. Greensky Unleashed is powered by ProfitMax. Did you know that 93% of businesses overpay on their taxes? Do you pay too much in taxes? A recent study showed that businesses are overpaying between 34 and 71%. ProfitMax has proven legal tax strategy solutions to reduce your tax burden. I'm not only a client, but I even join the team to help other business owners, just like me, pay only their fair share and nothing more. Go to ProfitMax.co. That's ProfitMax.co. ProfitMax.co to find out more. You can even connect with me there, as you should. And I'll help make sure that your tax bill is legally as low as allowed. ProfitMax. Keep your cash. But let's say that we want to do this. And we do not have that, that uh, unlimited checkbook yet. OK, so we want to begin a an initial roll up and we want to go with something that is guys with trucks that that do shit or guys with trucks that fix shit. That is your concept. And let me just tell you, from my own experience in business, you're right. I've been wrong. You're dead right. And I can see why. Now, <clears throat> let's say it's going to be either, um, you know, landscaping, pest control, HVAC, something like that. Right. How do we, as the the beginning stage, get in enough to create that platform experience, get the financing in today's day and age and world, and begin to get that that one roll up started so we can finally get into a swim lane within private equity? Well, so that that, that these are great questions. So let's unpack all of that. Sure. And uh, and and let's remember. So I've been doing this on at an institutional shareholder level, building big giant empires that sell for hundreds of millions of dollars, even billions of dollars. And and I'm now teaching. So after 21 years of doing this, I just got bored of, of building one company and all the tactical execution responsibilities. I wanted to help the masses. So I started working with small business and it's been a lot of fun, you know, working with people like you and uh, people in the crowd at, at JT's events. And really helping them learn the advanced tools that the big boys use and applying them in a small scale and getting the same kinds of results, just magnitudes different because of the amount of investment that, that's taking place. So, so yes, you can do this. It works small, just like it works big. So now let's start by unpacking all of this. If I'm going to start one of these adventures, if I don't own a business today, how, how, how do I stack the deck in my favor? Right. How do I how do I increase the odds that I'm going to be successful when I want to do this? And so, you know, you can be successful starting any business you want or buying any business you want, but I want you to be successful. So let's just unpack some quick data. 33 million small businesses in America defined by the SBA as being 500 employees or less. They employ 99.9 .9, or they represent 99.9% .9 of all companies in the country. They employ 50% of the country's workforce. 34 million small businesses, lots of them out there, right? So only 7% get to a million, only 4% of those get to 10 million, only 40% are profitable. So a lot of businesses fail, you know, five, about 50% fail in the first five years. How do I avoid all that risk? Well, first of all, don't do a startup. When we do a startup, we've got all this risk, you know, risk of can we build the market? Can we attract customers? Did we make good assumptions? Did we plan correctly? And I need a bunch of capital to be a startup. So I can avoid all of that by buying a pre-existing business of whatever size I choose. You know, I like to target if I'm an entrepreneur, let's buy a company with $1 million in earnings. So it probably has 4 million to 5 million of revenue, million in earnings. You know, that would be kind of a, a target range for me. And I'm probably going to have to pay five times. So I'm probably going to pay about 5 million for that company. Let's, let's come back to that for a minute. So All right. I, I'm going to buy a small business. Why? Because it's got a history of revenue, a history of earnings. It already has customers. And I can look at its financials. I can see how it's performing. I can apply this thing I call the 30-20-10 rule to make sure it's healthy. Does it have at least 30% gross profit? Our SG&A or customer acquisition and back office expenses 
less than 20%, am I generating at least a dime on a dollar in profit? And if I am, I can scale that company to a billion dollar business. And the work that I need to do is very different because it's not about getting it fixed or making it right. It's simply about how do I grow? How do I grow the revenue and make this thing bigger and, and make it more profitable along the way? So i rather buy than build. But now when I think about what kind of companies could I buy, you know, there's so many different companies out there, so many different industries. So I like to apply some, some of my, my, my Adam Coffee isms and, and my filters into how we pick this. You want to be successful? Write this down out there, people. Let's start by investing in needs, not wants. So we want a company that focuses on providing for a, something that's a need, not a want. What's the difference? Well, if I got a hole in my roof and it's raining outside and there's water pouring on my head, I have a need to fix that roof. But if I'm going out to a concert on Friday night and I'm taking my wife and my wife wants a new purse and she wants a new outfit, um, that's a want. It's not a need. She doesn't have to have it. You know, I do need the roof fixed. I don't have to have a new purse, you know, for my wife. You know, I'll, I want to give her the new purse. She may argue if, with yeah. that. She yeah. may find and, a need. Just well, that. you know, but if the economy goes south. She doesn't need it. And the market crashes. I get laid off. I got no money. I still got to fix the roof. Still got to fix the roof. But I don't have to buy the purse, you know, or buy the new outfit or buy the, the, the truck tires for my monster truck, you know, out in the driveway. And so it's like needs versus wants. Why? Because as an entrepreneur, if I invest and I focus on a company that has that takes care of needs, I'm going to be less cyclical when the economy goes south. Consumers still need my product. I may slow down like the rest of the economy, but I don't fall as far as companies and industries that focus on wants. So we want to invest in needs, not wants. Next up, we want recurrent revenue, not project-based revenue. And again, I've made money on any kind of company. I'm just trying to stack the deck in your favor. So needs, not wants. And then we want recurrent revenue, you know, contracted revenue, not project-based. Why is that important? Well, if a part of my SG&A expense is acquiring a customer, once I get one, I want to keep charging them. I want to have an ability to monetize them over and over and over again versus a project-based business where once I take care of their immediate need, then I got to go find a new customer to take care of a new need You know, for a new customer. I want regular recurrent revenue. So you talked about landscape maintenance. You talked about pest control. Let me use those as two proxies. I have a crew, you know, and they're out there and they're, 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 they're spraying pests. You know, they're spraying chemicals around the perimeter of my house. I live in Texas. I got giant bugs here. You can put saddles on these things and ride them around. No bugs get in the house. Mama's orders, you know, make sure we got good pest control service. So I sign a contract. They acquire me as a customer. And then I give them my credit card and I forget about them. And they charge me every month. I don't even look at my statement. I just pay the damn bill. It's like, I, it's going on, but it's a need. I got to have it. So I just keep paying it. And they can, they can continuously bill in me and they, they show up once a quarter. They spray the house, but they bill me monthly. They do that. So psychologically, the payment's low, but they're only providing service you know, on a quarterly basis. And they're, they're, they're getting me every month on my credit card. And you as a and business I have that. cash flow in that situation. And, you know, on the first of the month, that company hits all the credit cards. And the only things they have to worry about is about every four or five years when a credit card expires, they got to track down that consumer and say, give me the new credit card. Depending on which credit card they're using, sometimes even when they expire, the, you know, the, they see that the credit provider sees it's a regular recurring bill. And they just let them to continue to bill it, even though the number on the cards change. You know, American Express does that as an example. And so the point of the exercise is, I've got all of this revenue and it comes to me on the first of the month. I don't have to go looking for it. And so if I've got a business focused on needs and it's got a contract that never expires, never ends, then I've got, when I acquire a new customer, the revenue is additive rather than replacement revenue for a project I just completed. So again, we're trying to help your, your listeners stack the odds in their favor. Needs, not wants, contract versus project-based. You know, we want we want businesses that are low capital expenditure. Um, and this is important because, you you know, we, we talked about how we're going to buy this thing. We got to get back to that now. So if I have a business with low capital expenditure, so most service businesses, I don't have to go out and build a plant. I don't have to have a bunch of machinery, you know, or a bunch of a bunch of equipment. 
you know, essentially if I'm a service company, I'm buying trucks, I buy pickup trucks and I buy sprayers for my, my pest, you know, pest control company. And I fill it with chemicals. Now, you know, do you, and, do you, do you, do you buy the trucks or do you lease the trucks? Well, so I, 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 I buy the trucks, okay. not lease them because it's EBITDA friendly to buy things rather than, ex, you know, have expenses hit my P and L, you know, I'm selling EBITDA in the future. So I need to learn about EBITDA and I need to learn how to maximize EBITDA's potential. So I don't want to lease stuff. You can do a capital lease and, and, and get some similar benefits to buying, but you know, essentially we want to buy things, own things, not lease them. When I lease them, the payments, you know, are going to hit my, my operating expense. When I own the asset, um, you know, it's below the EBITDA line where I buy the capital equipment. And so it's EBITDA friendly, you know, and does, that's a whole, but it's a whole other I, I will ask though, does, does it, cause I mean, in, in some sense you, you, you're buying a business and you want ca private equity to buy a business. Do you, do you buy property or do you just lease the property as far as real estate? Well, private equity doesn't buy, um, yeah. Good, so another good question. So, you know, I, I, nothing wrong with you as a business owner owning the building that you that you occupy in your business. I'll just tell you that before you sell your business, you want to separate your real estate from the company, put it in a separate entity and put in place a fair market lease between your entity that owns the building and your entity that's the operating company that's inside. Because private equity firms don't want to buy real estate. You know, it's a mix of asset classes and it requires a great deal more diligence and, and they're, it's not capital efficient for them to buy the business. So that's one particular area where they would prefer, you know, that you, you have, you, if you own the building, separate it out, separate entity, and then charge a fair market rent to the operating company. And then when you sell the company, if you, if you don't stay with it, or even if you roll over and do stay with it, you're also going to have a secondary income stream from the building. From the rent, yeah, yeah. Yeah, from the rent. So as long as it's fair market lease and a fair reasonable term, you know, then you're going to have revenue for, you know, it could be five to seven years, you know, what, what, whatever the case may be, on your property, which is always good if you're a, a landlord. So, it, you know, at, at any rate, just going back to this. So the, the, the key about guys, trucks, broken stuff, guys, trucks, fixing things, guys, trucks, doing things, plumbers, electricians, HVAC, you know, pest control, power washing. I mean, I can come up with just roofing, flooring. I can come up with all kinds of different companies. They're not all needs, wants. They're not all contracted revenue. But, you know, just there's a lot of companies out there that have low capital expenditures. They essentially just have a fleet of pickup trucks and, you know, a, a small office and, you know, some computers and desks and what have you. And, and if you find something that's capital efficient, then you have a lot of free cash flow. So if you're buying a company that you're paying a multiple of earnings on a million dollars of EBITDA, EBITDA in a service business is usually close to what the free cash flow is, which means I now have a million dollars, you know, and I can use that million dollars to service the debt that I need to buy that business. So let me just tell your listeners real quick how to buy that $5 million company. So first of all, you know, million, million in earnings, I'm paying four to five times. Um, I'll say five, maybe is fair market. I'm looking for a good company. Maybe I'm looking for a good company that I can get a little bit cheaper, four, four and a half. But if I had to pay five times, so I pay 5 million for this business, how am I going to pay for this? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the current owner to become a rollover investor in this buy-in build that we're talking about doing. And so I'm going to try to convince them to roll over 30%. And so out of that 5 million, 1.5 million is rolled forward. So I only need three and a half million now to buy the business. And again, if I think about the just general math, if I've got a million and a half rolled forward, this seller doesn't necessarily know it, but he just became my equity. And the SBA, which is probably the easiest, it's not the fastest, but it's no, it probably the easiest. It ain't easiest. fast. I've done that yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's probably smart. one of the easiest ways to do this. But I, I, I'd start with a commercial bank, you know, see if I can get a commercial loan, lower interest rate, maybe, maybe no personal guarantee. SBA, I'm going to have to do a personal guarantee, guaranteed. Um, and, and so, I, you know, but I'm looking for now, I need three and a half million. And I've got a company that has a million dollars in free cash flow. Well, if I'm borrowing three and a half million and I'm paying 10% interest and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to service this on a long life amortized loan, um, you know, and, and so 
I probably am going to need, you know, just pure interest. I'm going to need 350,000, you know, if it's at 10%, um, if it's at 12% or a little bit higher, if I get a minimally amortizing loan where, where I'm paying principal back, but I'm, I'm not paying a great deal principal at any rate, I'm probably looking at about $500,000 a year in payments to buy that, you know, to get that and service that three and a half million dollar loan. And I've got what's called a two to one debt to equity ratio because I've got a million dollars in free cash flow and I'm only needing half of that to pay the debt. And so, plus I've got recurrent revenue, low capital expenditure, contracted revenue. And so I can convince, you know, banks that, hey, I've got a very stable company here. Look at it over the last five years, you know, and look at how stable it is. It's growing, you know, it's, uh, you know, it, it's got a recurrent revenue stream, you know, and I can get some favorable treatment. Chances are I can use the cash flow within the business to borrow against, you know, to, to service the money that I need to buy the company. Once I buy the first company, now I've got 70% equity. The former owner has 30% equity. Now I buy the next company. And when I repeat this exercise, the 30% the second person rolls over buys less stock because I value it at the new company, which is now 2 million in earnings. And at a five times, it's worth 10 million. And so now, now a, a three you know, or a $1.5 million rollover against a $10 million company buys a smaller percentage than one and a half against a $5 million company. And so as I buy this, it gets easier. I guess my point I'm trying to make is the hardest company to buy is the first. After the first, it just gets exponentially easier and I can keep buying companies, put them together. You know, and so let's just do some, some round numbers just to excite people. How much money could I make doing this and how long would it take me? Let's assume I buy four companies. They each have a million dollars in earnings and I pay $5 million for each company, five times. So I bought 4 million in earnings, paid five times, I need 20 million. So it's a service business. You know, I'm doing pest control, I'm doing landscape maintenance, I'm doing HVAC, I'm doing whatever I'm doing. You know, I'm buying a business that's healthy, that's run good, that takes care of customers, that delights customers, got recurrent revenue, low capital expenditures, high free cash flow. It's a growing business. You know, a lot of the companies like this that I, I work with, you know, they grow anywhere from, I'll just say 15 to 30% a year, you know? And so I'm putting four companies together. I paid 20 million with a small, reasonable growth rate. Very quickly, 4 million becomes 6 million, you know, 4 million becomes 5 million. Let's go with six. So 4 million becomes 6 million of earnings. You know, I now sell that company for about eight times and I get 32 million or six times eight, I'm sorry, 48 million. I got to pay back the original 20 million. So I pay back the 20 million that I owed and I make 28 million profit. How, how fast can I do this? Well, and my last buy and bill. Years? Yeah, I, I bought eight companies in three years and then I bought 15 companies in two years. So, you know, if I have an unlimited checkbook, I can do this really fast. Uh, if I don't, then I have to work one company at a time and it takes a little bit longer, not, not terribly much longer. I just have to solve for the capital. So my, my point in this is I don't have to waste 20 years of my life to generate wealth. I don't need to start something where I've got a 50% chance of failure. I can start by buying a successful small business. And in today's world, I got a newsflash for you. Right now, this is the largest wealth transfer in human history as baby boomers are retiring selling their businesses, you know, or literally dying and not even, even continuing their business or attempting to sell it. 80% of people who own a business never actually find a buyer or sell it. 34 million small companies, they're a dime a dozen. So while everyone's looking at all of these companies, you're sorting through all the chaff real quick. Needs, not wants. Contracted revenue, you know, recurrent revenue, not project-based. You're already like light years ahead of the rest of the people out there who haven't heard this podcast, haven't heard me speak about this before, and they don't know the secret to how to ice it and make sure that you're successful. We go by our first, it's the hardest, but we can do this. You know, there's capital out there that's going to help us. And we get that first deal done. The second deal becomes easier. The third deal becomes easier. And, and as we put these together quickly, we bought good businesses that are healthy, that are growing, and we're helping these entrepreneurs escape you know, and, and we're, we're taking over now the business. We're using our 
our business acumen that we've got from the Fortune 500 world or the ink just dried on our MBA and we're ready to now go out there and, and kill it. And, and so we get these businesses to grow, you know, at a, at a good pace, you know, using the tools that I talk about in, in my books or, or teach at the seminars. And, you know, you can do this really quickly. And, and that doesn't take, you know, it doesn't take 20 years to have a net worth of over 10 million or $20 million, you know, and, uh, and join kind of the decamillionaire club or in this country, over 30 million is how we define ultra wealthy. And so people who think that's a pipe dream, you can do this in a matter of just a few years. Well, based on yeah. your math, you're talking about probably anywhere between three to six years, you're already well into that club. Correct. And, and the great news is you can either keep going or do it again. Or while you're building the first and getting success, start the second. Oh, you know, and then oh. become a become a serial <clears throat> entrepreneur that always has one, two, or three companies. I got to change my 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 math a little bit, my my mentality. You know, the profile of the first business I buy might change now. Instead of looking for someone who's sixty years old or older who wants to retire, I'm looking for someone who's in their forties, you know, or fifties, and they still got lots of game left and. I'm going to back them as my CEO and they are going to be as a rollover investor going to get that second bite of the apple. They're still going to be highly interested and intrigued. I teach them what about what we're going to do. I get them engaged. And now I've, I call it, I've got my horse and I'm riding my horse. And now while that company is growing, I can double down and look for another one to do. And I can get two or three of these going at the same time. And Talk about after a seed there, Adam. I mean, listen to what you just said. You're basically saying, yes, you know, you get the first one going and, 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 and maybe you finally sold the first one into private equity. It's now in its next swim lane, but you kept 30%. And so now you get another bite of that apple down the road. But while you're sitting there as a minority investor in something, you can also go back start another one and now have two things growing at the same time. Sure. And you could be in one as a CEO growing it. The second one needs to be a different industry because sure. we can't compete, right. you know, and I'm going to need a, a, I'm going to need a horse. I'm going to need somebody that, that I can, can ride. Who's going to go with the business. And, and so you can choose how to play this. I'm going to step in, take it, get to the payday, be a rollover investor, put a bunch of money in the bank and keep building it because I know it now. And I know what to do, how to do it. And I, now I've got an unlimited checkbook. So I'm going to keep going in that industry. Or you can be Oz behind the curtain. And the profile of the first company is in their 40s, in their 50s, still got a lot of game left. I buy that company. I teach them about the buy and build and what's in it for them. They are the one who rides forward with the company. And when I sell it to private equity, hey, private equity guys, I'm just the money. You know, he's the guy. He's the magic. She's the guy or she's the lady. Who, she's the magic. I mean, she's, she's the guy the these days, Adam. You know, yeah, you know, it was a guy these days. You know, <laughs> yeah. you said maybe you throw out a zinger I mean, there. It's like you just well, did it. I'm in trouble. In I'm in trouble Adam already. It's Adam like just you know, offended I, people. So, 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 you know, but but we could be Oz behind the curtain, and and so the profile of the first company I buy is I need an entrepreneur who wants to continue to go with the company. They're going to be the person that actually is the the front person when we sell the business, and the profile of the second, third, and fourth. It's going to be someone who's in their 60s, someone who's approaching, you know, in their 70s and they want to retire and they don't have a, a succession plan. And and our horse and that first company becomes the succession plan. They know the industry. They're our expert. And so they can assimilate the larger business, you know, and we then buy companies two, three and four. While that's going, I go back to the next, find the next, you know, industry I'm going to tackle. And I get two or three of these going at a time. And after I get the first payday, Thomas. You know, so now I can self fund, you know, and, and maybe not a hundred percent of my equity because I still like to use other people's money. But if I don't now do a 30% rollover, I see when I bought the first company, it was a 30% rollover because I needed that equity to pacify and I didn't have the money. And so I used their equity to become my equity because once they roll over, we're partners. And so between us, we have 30% equity. We have a 30% down payment and I need to finance the rest. So I did that to be shrewd because I didn't have capital. Once I got capital, maybe I only let them roll over 10% or 15%. And then the other 15% becomes my equity, you know, at the beginning. 
I get the first company done. I still want to use leverage. It's efficient, but I can selectively use some of my war chests that I've just built up and I can build a model and I can see, boy, if I put in an extra, I just did this with a, an entrepreneur I'm working with right now, uh, just in, in this week, earlier this week, you know, so, so yesterday. And, uh, and I, I, you know, we were doing this exercise and I said, look, if you put, we built a model. If you put just an extra 750,000 in cash into this deal, instead of zero, if you put 750, instead of the entrepreneur rolling over 1.5 million, let him roll over 750, you put in 750 extra. At the end of the model, you made an extra 5 million. And, and, and on a 750 investment you know, of your equity is a selective strategic use of your equity, you get an extra 5 million in return. And if you don't, and you let that person roll over 30, they get the extra 5 million. And so do you want that 5 million you know, or not? Well, if you don't got the 750, you're going to give it away. But if you've got the money, because you've done this now once, you've got 10 million, you paid some taxes, you, know, you got 18 million, whatever the number is that you made on the first go round, I guarantee it's healthy because needs, not wants, contract, you know, it's like I, I stack the deck in your favor. When you do this now, you know, subsequent times, and you selectively insert your equity in the right spot, you can really juice up your returns the second time you do it. And so the first time is kind of your bike on a training wheels. And you're, you're, you're doing it at a minimalist fashion because you don't have equity. But once you're successful once and you create the equity, now I go to my next bike and I can, I can, I can take the training wheels off, selectively infuse my capital at the right strategic points, and now I'm juicing up my returns on the second one. And I go back and do a third. And it's like, this is a, a reiterative process. And once, once you know the mechanics of how to do this, there's no limitation as long as the companies meet my criteria. And as long as you're doing that, you, know, I, I, you can do this quickly. You can do it often. You can do it repetitively. I just spent 21 years doing it. And so for someone who's in their 30s or, or 40s especially, Focusing on this and, and trying to take this concept, it will literally give you generational wealth and then some because you've got a long enough runway to do it. Or conversely, you can save money and put it in mutual funds. And eventually, when you go to retire, you'll have a nest egg, but you will not have what you can generate over the next 20 to 30 years based on investing because that, that essentially this is this is really what you're talking about is 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 taking money and investing money very very wisely you could become a wildly successful incredibly successful multi 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 millionaire you can become a nine figure nine entrepreneur figure. Or, yeah, or you know, nine figure entrepreneur or, yeah i mean yeah. starting at 30 you might be able to make it yeah. to billion you don't know yeah so you know listen you know i i i tell people all the time you know a lot of people get very comfortable in a job. You know, I work in a Fortune 500 company. I like the big logo when I go to cocktail parties. You know, who do you work for? I work for GE or I work for, you know, Chevrolet or Ford, you know, General Motors, whatever. It's like, you know, and, and I, I, I've got a title. You know, I'm a vice president. I'm a, you know, I'm a this, I'm a that, general manager. And, you know, a lot of people get very comfortable with that. But I'll, I'll tell you that the true path to wealth never comes by working for someone else. It just doesn't. You know, how many is a percent of the entire Fortune 500 world? How many people make a million a year? You know, it's almost none. And, and, and so I'll, I'll tell you that you can earn a good living and you can, you can be a productive member of society working for someone else. But if you want to generate wealth, you know, true wealth, you want to fly around on private jets, you know, you, 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 want, to, you want to not worry about balancing a checkbook ever again in your life, you know, or, or worry about where money is going to come from for my kid's education or my grandkids education or their kid's education. It's like generational wealth comes from being an entrepreneur and it comes from being involved in, in business and, and buying and selling companies is one vehicle that we can use. And uh, entrepreneurs, you know, over the generations, you know, have, uh, you know, for the, the, the last, you know, few hundred years here in this country, you know, the, those who started businesses, they were the ones who created something and something from nothing. And they, they became the wealthy families. And you can do that. You can still do that in this country. People are doing it every day. And I, I kind of feel like 
I've been seeing a resurgence of entrepreneurial activity. I think more and more uh, young people, especially, are recognizing that I don't want to work for the man. You know, I don't want to. You know, it's like I, I don't want that path that my parents had. You know, or my grandparents had. I want to do something different. You know, I want to own a business, and so I'm seeing a resurgence of young people getting involved. You know, in in doing things like this, and so yeah, you know, it, we can get lucky. Lightning does strike, and we find our way through this, but. You can stack the deck in your favor. You can build a formula that almost guarantees your success or at least raises the odds tremendously Tremendous. in your favor. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah, you, you're talking about young people. And I mean, one thing that I find a lot of young people talk about, and I'm not exactly out there in the college campuses, you know, polling them, but, um, you know, I, I do end up talking with a lot of young people periodically through my travels. And, you know, they, they like to talk about, well, you know, I'm going to put this into crypto, you know, and it, it's like, that it could work. It, it it could, you know, or you could do something that probably has a much better chance of working. What you're suggesting, what you're, what you're preaching is something that has a, a very proven track record with a high degree of, uh, liability, a high degree of, um, success. And it's not always sexy, right? Look at the businesses that I've run, you know, HVAC, commercial laundry i mean that's not sexy on the top of anyone's i don't know list. adam because med- women like a man in uniform <laughs> my medical service company that was pretty sexy um you know so yeah you know, I, I i i'll tell you that you know true wealth you know, doesn't have to be sexy it doesn't have to be the newest thing you know there there's a, a rage going on around tiktok at least i i keep seeing videos jt keeps sending them to me it's like you know here's someone with a master's degree lamenting how you know, how much they make and how much, you know, her husband makes, who's a plumber, You're right? you know, or here, you know, here, you know, plumber makes more than a surgeon, you know, over, over a 10 year period. And you know, it's like, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. I don't have to create the next new tech platform or app, you know, or I don't have to experiment. I can go to something that's not sexy. That's been around for a thousand years, get in that industry and I can sexy it right on up until I'm a decamillionaire or, or an ultra wealthy person. And so it's like sometimes simple is better, simple is easier, you know, but I do run people through an exercise. So if you want to also, don't forget my filters, but if you also want to then decide, okay, but, but really I, I don't want to do a laundry company. So what, what can I do? So I tell people, get out a piece of paper, put three columns, first column, what are your skills? What are you good at? You know, and it's like, Hey, I'm analytical. I'm great at spreadsheets or I'm very good at, at inspiring. I'm a great closer. I can sell people. You know, it's like, what are you good at? And then I go to the next column and I say, what are your passions? What do you like to do? And then I look at the third column and I say, what companies, what industries would take advantage of your skills, would feed your passions? Because life is so much easier if you wake up in the morning and you're passionate about what you're doing, you know, and it, it ties together. What industries, what companies would fit that bill? Then apply my filters, needs, not wants, contracted revenue, you know, recurring revenue, not project-based revenue run through those iterations. And at the end of the day, what you're going to find is your path. You'll find your, your industry of choice and you'll be, have a higher probability of success. You'll have fun doing it and you'll make a lot of money. Now, how do we begin those stages? So let, let, let's just say hypothetically, you know, someone's, they've done the column, they've, they, you know, they, they understand the, the, the 30, 20, 10 rule They've checked the phone book to make sure it's, you know, fractioned enough. Uh, and, and, and they know I want to go into X industry. What is the next step? I mean, do they literally just start picking up the phone or do they walk into people's businesses and say, I can talk to the owner? I want to build a funnel. So great question. Yeah. So I, I've got my chosen industry. I used all my little, little rules we just talked about. I walked that road. I found my industry and now I have to build a funnel. And so I could build a funnel many different ways. Um, I could do, if, I, if I'm doing it on the cheap, I could just do Googling. You know, I could go to state websites and try to find out. So every company, when they register, create a, 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 an LLC or an S Corp, any company that registers with the state uses a NACIS code, an SIC code. It's like, this is the industry I'm in. It's number 65234, right. you know, whatever, whatever that case is. And and it's like they, uh, you know, I've got my NACIS code written down here because I need it all the time. It's five four one six one one. 
That's my NACIS code. And I can go online and I can buy a database. I want to know every company in the United States, or at least in this state, that's registered under NACIS 541611, which is consulting, you know, con, you know business consulting. And and if I if I buy that database, now I've got the top of my funnel filled. Um, I could go to Dun and Bradstreet. I could pay twenty five hundred bucks for a license to this thing called Hoover's, and I could do the same thing there. You know, and um, I, I have a geography in mind. I want to get started close to home. I'm in Dallas, so I want to find how many companies have the NACIS code in the industry I'm looking for. And then I got to do some shoe leather type work. I, I, I need to get on Google. I need to go to companies with websites and try to figure out, are they really doing what I want to do? Or did they just use the NACIS code and it's so broad that it could be you know, any different kind of company, multitude of different companies out there. And so I start then qualifying my funnel. If I got a little bit more money, I might spend 10 grand on a tool called Grata. You know, and now maybe I'm getting ownership information. This is who owns the business. This is our estimate of the revenue you know, for that business. And I start to then kind of filter my leads and now at some point I got to start doing outreach to people and, and I'm either going to be cold calling them, sending them emails, reaching out to them on LinkedIn. You know, I have to build the funnel and then and then sort the funnel, get to a target. You know, I, I typically would start with thousands of companies at the top and I'm probably working with about a hundred that I think are in my wheelhouse. And I'm going to start doing our outreach and and start trying to contact these people. And, uh, and so there is some sales element. If I don't want to do that, if I really stink at that, I could hire this thing called a buy side advisor and I could pay somebody about 5,000, 5,500 a month to go out and do it for me. And they'll serve me up warm leads. I'll pay them a commission at close because I bought a company that they brought in the door and I still have to do diligence and I still have to build a relationship, but they'll do all the cold calling stuff that I don't like to do. And I can pay to outsource that. I can use a tool like Grata, you know, or Dun & Bradstreet you know, or just, just trying to find databases online at government websites. And, you know, I can, I can, this is how I go about doing this. I always develop a filter, you know, and my set of filters, what does good look like? We don't want to buy fixer uppers. Life's too short. We only want to buy good companies that have good reputations, you know, and so I'm looking for revenue at this size, earnings of this size, a profile of who the owner probably is, they're probably in their 60s, 70s, retiring, you know, or they're in their 40s, 50s or younger, still got some game left, but they understand their industry. And I'm going to show them the benefits of doing a buy and build and being the president and CEO of the company that I'm going to build, buying three or four small companies, putting them together and selling them off to private equity. Um, and, and so we develop that profile, you know, but that that's kind of it in a in a nutshell. You know, we, we, we won't, I don't have enough time to go into, right. into any more detail really than that here, but you know, as we're approaching the top of the hour here, it's, it's, uh, you know, these are my thoughts. We can stack the deck in our favor and, and we can apply some basic rules and tips that I've learned over my career to drastically raise the odds of success for the people out there who want to do this. But, you know, to those, you know, to those who are willing to take the risk you know, come the, come the spoils of, of success, you know, and we get some failures too, but that's why we stack the deck in our favor. All right. Well, Adam, uh, as you said, we are coming to the top of the hour. I thank you so much for coming on the show. I would love to be able to do this again sometime, maybe even deeper level and God willing, I'll be able to discuss some things and, and, and dig in areas because I'll be involved in something like this and, and really have some fun with it. But I thank you so much for coming. Is there anything else that you want to tell the audience before we uh, end the show? Well, hey, look, um, my podcasts, if you hear me on an episode like this, they're free. Uh, my books are cheap. I donate my royalties to charity somewhere up there. There they are. I got some books. Um, and, you know, I teach the seminar coming up here in February. You can join me there. Or you can work with me one on one. A lot of different ways. But reach out to me on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is where you'll find me. Um, and I, I'm very active on, 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 on LinkedIn. So. People reach out to me there all the time. You can go to my website, adamecoffee.com. Um, and that's it. I look forward to hearing from your, your listeners. Good luck to everybody out there. Stay safe, be happy, take risks that are calculated, and enjoy the ride. Boom. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Thanks for having me.